Let's see, we're going live. Okay, we are live. All <laughs> right, so hello everyone, and welcome once again to the Latin American webinars on physics. I'm Joel Jones from the PUCP in Peru, and I'll be your host today. This is webinar number 95, and we're having Lucia Duarte as a speaker, who is a professor at Universidad de la República in Uruguay. Uh, Lucia did all of her studies here at Montevideo uh, with a joint PhD between Universidad de la República and the Universidad Nacional de Mar de Plata in Argentina. Uh, so today, Lucia will tell us the latest news in effective theories with heavy neutrinos, in particular regarding lepton number violating processes. Uh, so of course, we're very happy to have her as a speaker uh, today. Uh, now, before we begin, let me remind uh, all viewers that, of course, you can ask questions and comments using the YouTube uh, live chat system. And these questions will be passed on to Lucia by me at the end of uh, her talk. All right. So great. <laughs> Having said that, uh, let me pass uh, the microphone over to Lucia. Okay, so... Thank you very much for having invited me to the, the Low Physics and I'm very excited to, to be here sharing my, my work with you. So I'll start sharing my screen. Well, I think, okay, so do you see it well? Do you have my slide? Okay, great. So, well, this is my talk, Majorana Trainers. Oh, we are doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, okay. you're, you're having some issues uh, with, with your connection. Um, <laughs> we, we, we didn't hear anything that, that you that you said. Uh, can you hear me? Hello? Oh, oh, this is strange. We've been talking to her uh, for about half an hour <laughs> without any problems. Okay, so let's wait a minute until uh, she reconnects. Um, In the meantime... Oh, there she is. There she is. She's back. She's back. She's coming back. Hello. <laughs> I'm trying to see what happens with my connection. Sorry. <laughs> this is very strange because we were talking to you for about half an hour without a problem. Yeah. <laughs> now it is. Okay. Great. So, it's so can you please start at the beginning because you you started sharing and then it was it was all cut. Okay. So let's let's try it again. Let's try it again and share my screen now. So. I was telling you this. Can you see me now? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, right. great. So I'm going to talk about this Majorana neutrinos with effective interactions in the case. This is a joint work with Oscar Sampacho, who is my advisor at, at the University of the Mar del Plata in Argentina. And we've been working in this, in this effective theories for many years now. So it's a joint work with all the team in, in Mar del Plata. And I'm going to tell you about this paper we published last year, and I hope we get to the new results. Uh, I'll try to, to, to have them in the archive next month. So, is it all right? Are you, you, you get me well? Everything good. Okay, perfect. So, I will start my presentation, telling you my outline. I will have to move this over here. Here, okay. So let me start with the motivation. I want to make the case for, oh, sorry. Sorry, I, I have trouble with the, okay, now I'm on Anna. So I have this signs in my, in my screen. So I'll start to motivate my talk, trying to make the case for the standard model neutrino effective field theory. So, let me start to fix my notation. As you all know, in the standard model, uh, fermions acquire their masses by interactions with the Higgs bell. 
and you get the the Yukawa Lagrangian term where you have this this connection with the left-handed and right-handed components. I created it for the for the charged leptons here. And as the neutrinos don't have a right-handed component in the standard model, they don't get masses. And this also a violation, not between the families, not global and in fact uh, this flavor change from the the actine neutrinos can be explained by by the mixing with the massive propagating states you you describe this this mixing with the pontocorvo matrix and you can explain oscillations with masses for the light neutrinos that are below 0.1 electron volts. So we all know this, this, these things. This is just to, to remember what we are, what we're embedded in. And this makes us have the standard model. Uh, we need to, to incorporate masses somehow. And the easiest and, and most popular way to do it is the CISO type one mechanism. Mechanism. So you incorporate this right handed sterile fields, you call them sterile because they don't interact with the with the animal interactions. And you can write this Lagrangian, I call it LU. You write once you incorporate these right handed terms, you have a, a Yukawa term for for the neutrinos. And as they are sterile, and if you don't uh, if, if you allow for a lepton number violation, you can add this, this Majorana mass term for, for the sterile neutrinos. So when you write the, the matter, uh, the, the matter, the uh, terms for the neutrinos, you diagonalize them and then three sterile neutrinos, as I'm showing here, you will end up by having six massive states which are Majorana fermions, meaning that they are their own antiparticles and, and lepton number violation is allowed. So you get three light massive states and three heavy massive states. And it's called CISO because the more massive the heavy ones are, the lighter the others. So when you constrain this uh, mass to be below 0.1 electron volt or something like that, you can write the mixing between the active and the massive states and the thing is, you get this relation for the mixing that is, we call the CISO relation. And if you do this, this naively, you end up with a mixing that is, is really, really small. So there are ways to avoid this by, by having new, new symmetries, for instance, B minus L symmetries in, 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 the, in this Lagrangian. You can, you can add some kind of, of lepton number and, and conserve it somehow. But if you do this naively, you get really uh, a very tiny mixing. So as this mixing drives the coupling between the heavy states and the standard model particles, the thing is that if you don't do something, if you don't impose some other symmetries, you will end up with a mixing which is too low to explain lepton number violation. And we already have a uh, constraints, uh, very stringent experimental constraints on, on these mixings. Here they call V. This, uh, this is a plot by June last year that uh, can be compared with, with what we're talking about. So, for instance, you have this only beta beta limits from neutrinos, double beta decays, and so on. So, this mixing wouldn't be the guy I would uh, blame for a lepton number violation. What I mean is, if you were to discover a lepton number violation, maybe you have to explain it by something else. And that's what I want to talk about today. So, you can tackle this topic by saying, okay, I have these right handed fields. And I want to study their phenomenology, and I want to do it by um, in a model independent way. So you can say, okay, let's build an effective filter with these fields and the standard model fields. Then so what you would do is to have the standard model Lagrangian, then add the the CISO Lagrangian, and then you can add 
more operators with, with higher dimension that uh, to the to the Lagrangian that would parameterize this other new physics beyond the mixing that that could help you explain left to number violations and, and whatever you could find in experiments. So I'm showing you here the dimension five operators you can add. This has no no right hand in the tree, but this is the well-known binder operator. It gives you a Majorana mass for the actile uh, for the actile neutrinos. And you can also get an interaction with the Higgs, in fact. Then you have this other operator you can write with the right hand fields. This gives you also a contribution to the right hundred Majorana mass term that we were talking about a minute ago. And it also can give you a uh, an interaction with the Higgs field. So many people have started studying this because it gives you an interesting phenomenology. You can see this paper by Capodo and, and well, many people are starting now to, to study that. And you also can have this other operator, which gives you a tensor interaction between the, the right handed neutrinos and the photon and C boson field here in the in the U1 field strength. So that what that's what you can make a dimension five. But what I want to tell you today, it's a very easy description, our description with only one Majorana neutrino and concerning only effective interactions. So let me come back. I just want to show you that this operator here is uh, anti-symmetric in the, in the sterile uh, index. So you need at least two right hundred fields to, to have it. If, if no, it vanishes completely. So what we're gonna do is to consider only one Haley state, only one Majorana state, and only its effective interactions. So this is a benchmark scenario, which is very simplified, but helps you to gain intuition on, on which kind of things you, you could find beyond the, the CISO mixing. So we discard the mixing term in the renormalizable Lagrangian. Say you can put this, this coupling, this Yukawa coupling to zero. And we will consider only one massive state. So when I say the N, the heavy N, it will be the right hundred. It's, it's the same guy if you only have one. And you add a Majorana mass. So we will consider it as a Majorana particle. Then you can discard this O5 and phi contribution to the to the mass to the Majorana mass and, and and reabsorb it in the physical mass and you can discard these terms. In fact, we will not be discussing Higgs interactions here because we will concern the with BDKs. So that's why I, I'm not taking them into account. But this is this is useful to gain intuition. So what what we will do is having the effective um, this effective field theory Lagrangian, which includes the standard model and terms with dimension in the end higher than six. So I'm gonna try to tell you more about the, the operators you, you include when you when you use this model. So we have this effective operators with the Majorana N, and we have interactions with the N and the scalar vector bosons. Here's the, the interaction with the Higgs field. You can interact with the with the derivative here. It gives you an interaction with the set. I have this vertex here to show you. Then you can have this kind of, of term with 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 chart leptons. This would give you a nice vertex <laughs> between the L, Ws, and the Ns. These are vectorial interactions. Then you can have four Fermion terms also vectors and scalars. This parameterize many kinds of new physics that can be written in the end in, in, in this way. And you can have one loop generated operators. They give, they give you a tensorial coupling again between the, the photon and the cell and, and the Majorana. And so they give you this vertex we will be talking about right now. So let me show you more deeply which kind of interactions we will consider. So we have this NLF interaction that gives you this kind of vertex. So 
will, will be concerned by interactions with quarks and, and charged leptons. So you have this this kind of, of of vertex here. And then we will be concerned with the four fermion interactions. We have vectorial ones and scalar. So if you want to check more about the this these operators and the bus uh, a real bus is and all that you can you can check these these papers here so beyond the three level generator as i was saying we have the one loop generated uh, operators these are suppressed by a loop factor in fact and they give you this very rare interaction between the heavy neutrinos light neutrinos and photons. So this is our pink elephant in the room. <laughs> if you include these operators, you have this decay channel of GN, and this will change things in your phenomenology. And it's very surprising, or, or it gives you new new things that we will be discussing right now. So you have this width of the N, the heavy N going to light neutrinos and, and photons. Other people have discussed the, the constraints on this kind of operator and, and try to work with it. So I, I recommend you to check those papers. And now let me go to tell you how to put bounds on the on the couplings of each effective operator. So when we started a life many years ago, we, we took this answer. So we said, okay, we have this dimension six term giving you this vertex here and you could compare it to the one you get uh, the similar vertex you get with when, when you do the mixing in the CISO one so we said okay let's let's compare the the mixing in the CISO with uh, our our alpha effective couplings so we said okay as we have bounds on this interaction, very stringent bounds on these interactions, at least we should put bounds on our operator that are equivalent. So if I'm, if I'm putting this new interaction, I have to bound it because I already know that we have constraints on this. So what we did was exploit existing bounds and mixings, taking this, um, this comparison, this is the dimensional quantity that you have here. You see you have the, the coupling, the bed squared, and two times the squared of the new high energy scale, high energy physics scale you're introducing in your in your effective field theory. And we need that for every operator and all finalists. So you have this the lepton of family I, and then you say, okay, this is my alpha I for, for any operator. So it's not only this interaction and comparing, but, but everything. And you we started exploiting it, the, exploiting the bounds you have on the mixings. So the first bound you have, the strongest one is the, um, the one from Naturalist double beta decay. You can see it here, uh, there's the limit from, from Gerda, where you can canon send because it's, it's more stringent yet. And you can bound the, the first family operators that, that give you a contribution to, to this process. So again, you can use the bounds on the neuron and tau couplings. And the thing is that you could compare in you know, the mass scale uh, with, with every experiment. But the thing that happened is that as we have this new channel, this neutrino photon channel, we, we couldn't get the bounds uh, translated so easily because not every experiment would, would function if you had your Magellan neutrino to, to, to have this decay. So in the end, we started considering the, the Delphi bounds here, which are which are compatible with having a, a Majorana and with this decay channel. Here's the diagram. And you can see that it, it fully covers the, the branching for low masses now compared to, to the case to, to, lepton, to leptons and, and, and fermions. So this really changes how you, how you study your, your phenomenology. In fact, 
if you add, if you allow this channel to be on. So this is if you let your tensor uh, operators to be on, if you, if you let your tensor couplings to, to be non-zero, the width, this normalized width to this, to this coupling here, it changes a lot. So here I have a plot. If you let the neutrino decay to, to photons, and you see this is more than one order magnitude compared to the width you get if you don't let this channel to be on. So this will be something that will be taken. We, we will have to take care for. So I will move and show you again this comparison between the Swiss scenario and what we are having. So we have this, these sets of operators. We, we treat them for the numerical treatment. So you have well, sets one and two and four and five. So in the first three sets, you put on your, your tensor operators that allow you to have this photon neutrino decay. And then in the blue ones, you let on your vector uh, couplings, your vector operators, and in the green ones you have your scalar couplings, and these were the plots that I was showing you before. And I want to compare with what you do, which is the same thing here when we normalize, the comparison with the width you get in the season model when you put your mixings all equal to one. So if you compare here, you have more than 10 to the minus 7, and here you have a bit more than 10 to the minus 9. So it, it changes, it changes your lifetime for, for the end. So that will have consequences. Also, sorry, here you can see, you can put a coefficient in front of a, each type of, of, of decay the end can have in the CISO model. And these this, this coefficients are, are already very constrained. So they are in the best case, 10 to the minus eight. So that will be a difference uh, for us. So now let me go on to tell you about this NVIDIA HPD case I, I wanted to, to show you now. So what will be, what we will be studying is a BBK to a child which can be a new one or from the Madrana N. And then this guy, we will consider it can be gay to this neutrino photon interaction uh, uh, final step we've been talking about or you can let it go to a lepton and a bion so first i will tell you about the last year results we have exploited a uh, bounce from bell and from lhcb on this on these processes to translate to bounce on our effective couplings and then the work in progress uh, this year has been using the Bell 2 prospects to measure this B to tau and neutrino decay, which can be confused with tau to N decay if the N escapes the detector, to see if you could tell the difference between the standard model and the, and the effective theory measuring the tau polarization. That's one thing we, we, we were trying to do. And we also have to, we also had new bounds from, from this decay and we have this uh, forward backward asymmetry between the photon and the lepton here this is a plot from from the belt to physics book so we can construct an asymmetry between these two guys and see what contributions you have for when when you include these effective interactions so i'll start telling you this before I go to the results, I want to show you part of the calculation. Here you have the vertex with the B decaying to N and the lepton. You have to calculate this, this amplitude and you see that when you, when you do this, as the B is a pseudo scalar, uh, you have um, only this kind of currents alive. So the surviving ones are the pseudo vector and pseudo scalar terms. So when you calculate the width of the B going to a uh, charged lepton, which in this case could be the tau or the muon, 
and the Magellanian tree, you will get something like this. I have simplified it for, for you. But what I want you to see is that you have kinematic non-dimensional non terms, but you have the scalar squared terms, which have a, a quite mass denominator here. So this factor is, is, is more than one, it's like six or seven. So this really enhances the scalar interactions compared to vector ones. So here we have these coefficients with the, with the scalar coefficients for the S1, S2, and S3 operators. And you will see that, that all of our numerical results will be, will be interpreted in, in this way. We have the, an enhancement of the scalar contribution coming from, from this curve. The same will happen when the end decays to pions and, and leptons. So this is something I wanted to comment before showing you my results because we'll find this is this is something important. So let me tell you what we found. First, we consider this radiative leptonic B to mu nu gamma decays. We have these bonds from Bell that haven't found it, so haven't found the the this decay yet. This is easier to measure than the non-radiative decay because if you only have muons, this goes like the mass of the muon squared. So they are more measurable than only the muon channel, this, this radiated channel, but, but they, it's still not found. So they have this bound, they, they give you on this uh, integrated branching ratio and the standard model value is more or less five times to five times ten to the minus seven. You have to integrate this branching. This is why it's called a partial integrated branching fraction between the available energies of the photon. So you have a, a lower energy cut that we take it to be one GB because that's what they got there. And this is to ensure that your treatment of the QCD approximations is okay to the, to the maximal energy. So this is kind of the, the standard model calculation and we do the same, but with our effective theory. So you consider the width of the B going to mu one and N, and then the branching of the N to neutrino and some photons, which is almost one. In, in this mass regime. And when you do that, you, you get to use this bound to get constraints on your mixing. So how do we do that? We fix all the values of the, of the couplings, the scala, the vector, and the tensor couplings to the same number. And we parameterize it uh, considering this alpha and translating it to u squared, and you then get all your quantities depending on the mass of the end and this u squared thing. So when you do that, you can find for each mass which are the values of u squared that let you be below the, the experimental bound. And this is how we construct this, this uh, plot. So for each mass, you have an upper bound for the u squared, and this is made for each coupling set as, as I told you before. So as, as was explaining you, we can put better bounds on the sets that include the, sc the scalar couplings. Set, set once is, it has vector and scalar operators on, then set three is only scalars, and set uh, two is only vectors. Here, of course, you have all the tensors couplings on because you need to have this decay working. And you can translate again this u squared, um, this u squared limits into alpha limits. So that's a first kind of bound you can have directly from, from, from BDKs. We also studied the bounds you can get from Bell, uh, from, sorry, from LHCB. So I, maybe you remember, but uh, years ago, LECD gave model independent limits on the decades of Bs to muons and, and pi. This is a leptin number violating uh, process. They were doing it for the CISO model. 
but but they gave this this kind of plot which for each mass they have this this lifetime for the end and this this changes their detection efficiency so they have different plots different plots with with upper bounds for the different lifetimes of their n and they have made an interpretation for the the muon Majoran mix in, in CISO type one which was criticized by Shu and Peskin afterwards. So this is the plot by 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 Shube in this paper. They have this was the original LCD limit, and we have the revised limit because they were using a, a very nice uh, uh, model for for this decay. So when we saw that, we said, okay, we, we can do same. We can use uh, these bounds to to put them on on our effective theory so we calculated the dk to trend and new and then let the the end decay to pi and some units and we we, well, we we calculate the branching fraction on that for each mass we all uh, we do the same that we did in the last in the last slide i would pick we fix all the alphas, and then you have the your lifetime. Here is our translation of the bounds from from an HCV, and then you can get a bound in your in your mass and u squared uh, plane. So here are the bounds. The black line is the bounds for u squared that that Chube and Peskin got. And these are our bounds on our interpretation that is u square. So again, if you let the Majorana neutrino to also include in the in the total width here the tensor operators, you have these bounds in the sets we call one, two, and three. Set one includes scalar, vector, and tensor operators. Set three includes just color and tensor operators, and set to has only tensor and vector operations. This is why the vectorial bounds are, are weaker, as, as I was telling you before. And you can do the same for the set where you don't consider the, the tensor uh, interactions, so you don't have this decay to the to neutrino and photon. And you see, you can put much more stringent bounds in this case. But also, of course, the scalar, the scalar bounds, the bounds on the scalar operators are, are tighter than the ones in in the vectors. Again, this is the curve, the curve by by Schube. So let me summarize what we had. We have this summary of effective BDK bounds. So for every set. We have found limits on this alpha and n plane. And you see these are the bounds from the muon radiative decay here. And here you have 10 to 1. So this is 10. And this is 1. These are very, very low. This is no, no, no much stringent. But then the bounds from the B to mu, muon, and pi decay. Are much better if you if you translate them to the alpha and then plane. So this is what we got in the paper last year. This these bounds could be compared with the people from with bounds that other people are, are are starting to have now using this kind of simplified scenario where we are using. There are some differences, so they're still not fully comparable, but but people are starting to to work on this. So. That makes me very happy. And then I will try to show you the new results that are yet unpublished. I hope I can, I can make it for next month to the archive. So let's consider the, the B to tau and neutrino decay. This could be confused, of course, in experiment with the effect of decay to a heavy end if this guy escapes undetected. So, uh, there's no uh, single observation with more than five sigma from one experiment of, of this decay right now, but there's a combined limit from the lambda bar. So you have this branching. This experiment, a measure of the branching, given this number, and we said, okay, we first could 
uh, try to use it to impose bounds on, on our couplings. So we calculate the theoretical contribution, uh, adding the standard model and, and the well, and the and the Majorana contribution, and then we again translate this to bounds on the on the MN alpha plane, consistent with the the theoretical branching, not changing too much from the experimental. Uh, value and assuming that you need the, this n to live more than ten than a thousand picoseconds so that it, it escapes undetected. So for this lifetime to be to be as high as this, you need to you need to kill your tensor operator. So the only sets that you have you, you can use is this we were calling four, five, and six, where you have the tensor operator off. And, and you see here the limits you find. Here's the curve below where you can have uh, in the in the M and alpha plane the, the, the lower you the lower zone where you are consistent with, with these conditions. And I have plotted here the LHCB limit to, to compare. So we get more, the, the, the LHCB limit is trading more, more stringent than this. If you only consider the couplings to the third family, you get this curve. So the, the, the area is much, much bigger. But if you consider all the, the three family couplings, you, you, you end up here. And the same you can do for the other set. So this set has vector and scalar interactions. And this set has only scalar interactions. As I was saying, the vector only gives no interesting bounds because you, you get, uh, you, you have so loose numbers. So you don't get a, a nice plot. <laughs> That's why I'm showing you this. And the other thing we wanted to do with this decay is see, okay, what if you measure the tau polarization? Can you can you separate it? Can you compare it to the, the standard model number? If you do the standard model calculation, it gives you sharp one. And then you say, well, if you do the calculation for the effective theory, you get a uh, lower, uh, you get a lower final tau polarization. So we say, okay, can we measure that? Okay, could it be seen? somehow, sorry, in the experiment. And then you have this, this uh, beta uh, level curves. This would be 0 0.95, 0 0.9. So if you can tell the difference from the measured polarization to the, to the standard model one. And we find, well, this is not so encouraging as we first thought, because the allowed region is down here for the set four and for sex six, so it's not that you will be able to distinguish it very much if you could measure this this decay, for instance, in, in Bell tube. So we have to look for uh, a better environment, maybe other other experiments to to look at this. And then the last thing I want to tell you is a nice result that you would get studying a forward backward symmetry in this B to muon neutrino and photon decay. So if you consider this, this is symmetry between the charged lepton and the photon, uh, you know, it's a simple forward backward symmetry measuring how many times they go in the same direction or, or on the contrary. And if you calculate this for the standard model, this is not a, a lepton number violation uh, the violating decay because you can see if this neutrino is a neutrino or anti-neutrino. So you have a kind of interference between the lepton number conserving and the lepton number violating final state. So if you calculate it in the standard model, it gives you a number that is below zero. You can see it easily in the case where the photon has is maxim the maximum energy because you see that when that happens in the standard model, it has to come backwards with the, with the muons because they take their maximal energy when the other two guys go, uh, go, the other, or go in the other the opposite direction. And if you make your calculation in the effective theory, considering 
the decaying like this, you can have your contribution added to the standard model one. And we made a numerical treatment here that in which we consider the scalar and vector interactions to be summed up and divided by two. And so that's how we get our tensor couplings. This is just to be able to make two d plots on this. And so for instance, here I'm, I'm showing you the standard model values, which are the dots. And then for each Majorana mediator mass, you can see the full contribution. So this is the, the, the adding up of the standard model and the effective result. And what's interesting is that the, when you include the defective interactions, you get uh, less negative values, but the, you have a contribution that is on for, for um, an interval in the, in the photon energy that can be explained by, by kinematical reasons. In fact, you can calculate the boost of this guy and, and calculate the angle in the biggest frame. And this depends on the velocity of the of the end and its, its boost factor. Of course, it depends on the energy of the photon and the, and the Majorana mass. So you can make this calculation and get this plot. For each mass, you can see that the contribution, for instance, let's let's see the, the 4G beaker. The contribution starts to be more positive, so not that negative. When this cosine starts here, this is one point something, one point five something, which is right there. And then it, it goes on contributing to less negative numbers until it gets to negative values of the cosine again. So here is where the contribution stops. And the same thing happens for, for every value mass. So that was interesting to discover because we, we first had this plot from our Monte Carlo simulation. And then we say, okay, that will explain that. And it was something nice to, to find. And we also can compare the scalar contribution. Here I was putting the scalar operators on and the vectors off. And you can compare with the only vector contribution, which is much, much lower. This is the same effect we, we, we've been finding due to this, this decay that I was showing you before. And you can see that if you plot the distance in sigmas from the standard model values, which would be alpha scalar and alpha vector equal to zero for each mass, you can find that, of course, these curves are, are more, uh, how do you say, wide in the scalar direction and the vector direction. So this, this you can understand again, from uh, from the the enhanced scalar interaction. So this is all I wanted to tell you. I'm going to summarize, but not summarize because it's been too short. So <laughs> I just want to give you my message that the standard model tree effective theory is a nice model independent way to get info on possible new physics beyond mixing contributions to, to the heavy end phenomenology. So we, we could try this, uh, this study in a, in a more organized and systematic way to, to constrain these operators. And there are lots of parameter space to be explored yet. So join us and, and we can tackle this, this theory in a more systematic way. And OK, thank you very much for, for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, so, so I'm, I'm sorry, Lucia, that I had to turn off your video. <laughs> just to yeah, sure. I saw, I saw it. <laughs> just to make sure that the connection was was uh, was okay. You can try and turn it on back on now if you if you want. Okay, you can start because the host has stopped you. <laughs> That's what it says. Ah, really? Okay, so let me let me see if I can if I can. I can stop you. sharing my. Uh huh. There we go. Okay, here I am. All right. Great. Okay. Okay. So super. So thank you very much for the for the talk. It's been it's been very 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 interesting. It's been um, so fast. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, <laughs> given the time constraints, I think it was perfect. Okay. Thank um, you. So so um, 
I don't know if there's any there are any questions from from the audience. I have like three questions or so, but I, okay. let, let's, let's say let's see if any if, if there's anybody else here that would like to start. Um, okay, so so I'll start. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so can can you go back to to the slides where you showed those little uh, the, the, those new contributions? Um, for for the symmetry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay. I'm gonna. How do I go back? Okay, here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so, so. I so do you want me to, to put it on full screen or or uh, you yeah, see it you well? Can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that you can see it a bit better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. So, 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 so I found this this very interesting. You you say that that extra contribution mm -hmm. um, comes from from the additional uh, production of the heavy neutrinos. But yeah. that is a kinematically constrained, a kinematically constrained to particular values of photon energies, right? Yes. And that's why we have those little. Uh, that's it. Depending on the n mass, mm -hmm. you have the allowed energies for the photon. Right. So outside of that region, one would one should get uh, roughly the, the standard model. Uh, yeah, spectrum. that's it. Which is what one sees, like for instance, on the on the on the orange curve. The right? orange but, curve, yeah, that that's that's that can be distinguished from the solar model until, until you enter to this zone, this allowed zone. So so this what is happens, for 5GD. Right. So what happens with the red curve? See, the, there the red curve uh, deviates from the from the central values of the. Standard the red curve down there, yeah, it deviates. And in fact, the thing is that it gives you a more negative contribution because you see here that when the Majorana mass is 2 GV, you get all the time for, for all the photon energies, you give a, a negative number of cosine theta. So oh. this enhances the value of the standard model and, and moves the, the asymmetry to lower values. I see. I see. That's the same thing that happens with the green. This curve. is the curve oh, here. Oh, yeah, oh, and oh, this okay. is the same going on with the green curve. When you give this cosine negative value, it goes to more negative values than the standard model. That was very interesting to find. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I find it very interesting too. Okay. Oh, because okay. in the when we started plotting, we said, okay, what are these bumps? And and finally, we we, we said, oh, well, it's this the end boost. So that's it. What changes with the with the model and with the with the cup the values of the couplings is the amplitude. You, know? you get more. I was showing in the next slide yeah. when you when you change your 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 couplings to values that contribute more to to separate the the value from the standard model value. Then you have a, a bigger amplitude. That's it. But but you can understand it that way great no super very interesting indeed um so <laughs> uh, let me ask one more question before uh, reading all the all the all the questions on the on the chat and, and letting the other <laughs> the other organizers <laughs> ask so so okay so at some point uh okay so 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 you you showed us um, results for a heavy neutrino decay into a photon and a light neutrino. That was your mm -hmm. your work from from your last paper. Uh, yeah. And then uh, at some point you 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 switched the decay into a, a muon and a pion, right? Yeah, two muons and a pion. <laughs> right, right, exactly. But but the, right. So so the final state was to yeah two muons and a pion. So um, the question there is that at, at some point you do mention that the branching ratio into into photon and neutrino is 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 dominating. Yeah. Uh, but then in the other case you don't have that. So what are you doing? Are you just turning off that? I can turn if I turn off the tensor couplings. I don't have this 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 neutrino photon channel. Yeah. So you're turning uh, that off. That yeah, order. if I turn that, let, let me go to the slide. The thing is, you, 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 have the, you always have this channel, 
but what changes is the the total width because if you let the the uh, the photon channel on the width uh, is much bigger okay, so much bigger. this this lowers your value in this in this channel that's why you get more stringent uh, values of the of the for more stringent bounds for the sets where you put off the the tensor operators right so, so depending which coupling you have on, you have different observables, of course, that could... Yeah, that that's could it. Happen. But the, the bigger difference is made by, by if you have this channel on or off. Great. Super. Super. Um, so, so I don't know if there's anybody else in the, in the audience who would like to, to ask uh, questions. We have uh, Roberto, Nicolás, so we have a guest, Leon who might want to ask questions too. Yeah, I, I have a small question. Is it, yeah. is it, is it possible? <laughs> I don't know, maybe I, I, I didn't get this part, but can you get other observables related with pi and zero or something like that? Like to, yes, of course. The, the same procedure, I mean, that the same operator impact many other the observations. The same operators impact many other observations. Yeah, in fact, we were trying to see what happens with this, these anomalies in BDKs also. You, you can contribute to many, many other, uh, many other observables. So we, we did this because we started with this bounce because the bounds were tight and we wanted to see what which bounds we could get. But then discover that you, you can try to study more and more observables in, in BDKs and when the phenomenology is, is wide, so you can do many things. We we had been studying the production of these ends with the effective theory in the, my PhD, and then we started to study many cases, but, but it, these channels contribute to, to many, many observables. That's why I say that there's much place to exploration of this, of this effective model. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, so, so let's first go now, 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 go now into the, the questions from the chat, okay. and then we can go back to, to questions from, from all of the other listeners. So let's see. Um, first, you have uh, a question by uh, Diego Restrepo. Okay. okay. So <laughs> nice. Here we go. <laughs> yes, grab on the hold to something. <laughs> so, what is the relation between mm. the right handed heavy neutrino mass and the lambda? And lambda. Well, I didn't mention that, but uh, let me go backwards. So that I can go back to yeah, so we're what lambda is. <laughs> what lambda is? So lambda is oh, lambda. the this uh, this high energy scale you consider for your effective theory. So one could say, okay, you have to. Uh, the first uh, thing you you can think of is that okay, I want I want to relate lambda directly with the mass so that this is the scale where I can produce this Majorana neutrino. But then you find that it could be the scale where you have these new interactions because each operator will be will have to be mediated by something in the in the UV theory you consider. So when you when you think about that, you know for instance you have this this four fermion operators and the vector operators are mediated by, by vector by vector stuff and the scalars are mediated by scalar stuff. For instance, this S3 could be realized by the mediation of a laptop work. So depending on the UV complete model, you can say, okay, I can relate this lambda scale to the mass of each mediator. That's why we don't treat it to be the, the the end mass, because the end is a, is a low energy degree of freedom in our effective theory. We are not integrating it out. So it's not his mass that should be related to the, to the lambda scale in principle. Super, I hope, I hope Diego satisfies. <laughs> yeah. <I hope. laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so let's see. We have, uh, uh, this is not a question, but this is a, a comment by Mark Bartholomew, who is, have, who is uh, thanking you so much for the talk and uh, saying that- Great, thank you. Really rocked. Muchos thanks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and Jonathan Cardoso is also thanking you. Uh, okay. We have uh, Percy Cáceres. Uh, who uh, also is saying that it's a nice talk and would like to know uh, if in the vertex for the right-handed neutrino decay, uh, do you mm -hmm. integrate one loop of Higgs field? Wow, well, which vertex? <laughs> I have so right, many. The, 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 I, I, I guess he's talking about the tensor terms. So I will move to this like can you you see my slide there or I have to share it fully. So here what you have is uh, just that these operators can be generated in the high energy theory, UV complete theory, whichever you like, have to be constructed using loops of whatever the fields are in the loops. So we are we're not specifying what's going on inside that but yes you can have uh, the terms with the uh, Higgs bev here that those are the ones I'm, I'm using but they also give you interactions with the Higgs and all that so in if you want to go to see this paper is where, where I write the, the full arrangement and you can see all the all the interactions that you can have that that those operators give you because there are many Lagrangian terms. We were concerned with this because this is the the, the one who affects more the phenomenology. I, I don't know if I'm answering the question. Well, in any case, uh, the, the, uh, Percy can, can write on the chat. There's a slight lag okay. between between the transmission and what one sees yeah. on, on YouTube. So, so if if it wasn't clear, <laughs> then he, he has a chance to yeah, ask again. I hope so. Um, so any other questions from the participants here? I have one more, but I'm going to wait and see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so 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 I'll, 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 um, in the in the the result you presented uh, for again a uh, heavy neutrino going into photon and light neutrino. Uh, could mm -hmm. you have used instead the dimension five operators, adding two, two heavy neutrinos? Yeah. Instead of yeah, of course. <laughs> I know why you asked me that. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so let me move backwards. So if you, have, if you have this dimension five guy, if you have two right-handed neutrinos, no, say you have two indices, say one and two, for instance, you 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 should have this operator. This comes with uh, only one lambda suppression, not, not lambda. So this would be a higher contribution to, to that effect if you had two neutrinos. So this gives you a tensor coupling, a magnetic coupling between the two heavy ends and the photon and well, all, all your mixings and, and the set also. So you have bounds to add for the guy, but but it was it would also give you a, a higher uh, interaction between the, the neutrinos and the photons. So you could bound in uh, more stringently also, and and it would give you a very nice feature. <laughs> so yes, but as we are only including one sterile neutrino, that's to avoid all the mixing because it's it's kind of it doesn't let you see the, the effect of the of the new interactions. So that, that's why we, we, we don't consider it. It's easier, but it also <laughs> helps you to see what goes on beyond the mixing. But if you had mixing, then you can have that operator and that will give you a higher contribution to that decay. Yeah, of course. Great, super. <laughs> and many more things. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, so, so Percy says that yes, you have answered okay. the question, so he's happy. Okay. And now we have yeah. another question in the chat. We, we're on a okay. roll. <laughs> <laughs> so the next question is if, uh, from Jonathan Cardoso. Mm -hmm. 
is asking if there is uh, some relationship between uh, these neutrinos and the B meson anomalies. Well, the, we haven't studied it, but there's many people working on that. So I'm citing all those guys in the paper. I hope I finish for next month. But there are, there are contributions. There's a new paper by Antonio Pick, in fact. That, that have that have tackled that issue. They they have a, a low energy effective field theory with with right hundred neutrinos, something very similar to this. And they they do they do some calculations and get some bounds. They are not easy to translate to this word because I'm in a very simplified scenario. But but yet it, it would affect the, the the anomalies. So that's something people can go on starting. Great, super. So, uh, okay, so it's been an hour already. Maybe we should, maybe, I'm, there, maybe there are some urgent questions still. Okay. Okay, so I think, okay. I think we're okay. There's nothing in the chat either. We've given a little bit of time. <laughs> so, Perfect. <laughs> so there shouldn't be any lag. Now, okay, so great. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very no, much. No, no, nothing more from the from the chat. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> so thank you, thank you very much, Lucia, for 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 this talk. It's been great uh, having you around. I'm glad. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, before we log off, I would like to remind everybody mm -hmm. that we have the next uh, webinar now in two weeks uh, by uh, Sean Hart. All right, so please don't miss it. It'll be very interesting, all right? So thank you once again, and see you all uh, on the next webinar. Okay, see you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>